um, to say that the resource of um, this particular kind of thing was actually be used but, um, um, the workings of power and how power works um, to the advantage of some and to the disadvantage um, um, of others and how maybe therefore we could show how this worked and by doing that have two effects um, one, our colleagues in linguistic will immediately say yes of course that's what we're doing um, and there's uh, others who were, were interested in issues of power and inequality and inequity would say well here's a means for uncovering the kinds of things in, in the way um, um, you're doing at the moment now I would have to say that as far as the first um, um, aim of reforming the linguistic system then, that was a spectacular thing and I think continues probably to this extent uh, to, to, to this day to be a failure um, except maybe linguistics is sort of dying its fight and, um, and something else come along and, uh, and, and be more useful. Um, which is not to say that we didn't use the kinds of insights gained by mainstream linguistics um, in kind of an uneasy un blend of Halliday um, and Chomsky. For instance, the notion of transformation we used um, to say, um, well, have a sentence of this kind and somebody changes it into a nominal kind of thing. What actually is happening? What's happening there? What's happening which is and socially, and then we use that. Um, but it's a uh, famous phrase which was um, language is as it is because of certain society. So that conversation of another grammar kind of thing, and we have able to make uh, contributions in different ways, um, and that's been the fantastic um, thing that has happened now. Um, in no way is it the case, of course, that um, critical discourse analysis now um, is a kind of homogeneous and um, uh, came from somewhere quite different. I mean, it wasn't just because. Um, the notion of there are things to be understood. They thought that maybe um, linguistics could be used um, um, as the past that was before, but um, that the critical was in the air. As you know, critical sociology and there was critical education, there was critical pedagogy and critical everything. Um, and you have to ask, why was that? <coughs> and if you wanted to do anything kind of that was new, it was critical. And, and now it's so it is 30 years on, and it's very different than that, but also um, in the 1970s. Um, were academics really so clever, and um, something that nobody else had noticed? Um, or was it perhaps the case that um, even 20 years ago, someone noticed that things ought to be different, you know, like Bill Haley and the Comets, um, or Elvis Presley and Jail House Rock, and Paul Cliff Richards, or um, things were, they were kind of so frozen that the, the era of the Cold War, the social and originally by other people were doing the day kind of breaking up well before academics latched onto it and said, let's be critical. Yeah, so I, I think it's important also to kind of see um, how academics quite often follow and pick up on something which somebody else had done um, maybe 20 years earlier in a much more effective way. Um, but the question that I then have um, is the moment now still the moment for being critical? Because if to be critical is to, about which you are uh, critical, to put it into crisis. Um, and if we're attempting to be critical about society, putting social structures um, into crisis, um, I would say there's actually no need to do that, um, because social structures are in crisis. They're sort of dissolving, they're fragmenting, they're kind of, uh, you don't need to put effort into putting it socially into crisis. Um, it's doing it by itself now. You know, I mean, the things that we call globalization and um, economic force and the technological force are doing it for us. And so when, I, when I've now sort of shifted, um, well, maybe some 12 years ago or more, um, saying critique looks backward. Um, somebody else do. Let me ask your E, this is really And how is, how, how is it harmful to me or to others? And, and let's kind of then undo that, that structure that we kind of in really. And of course that still goes on. But maybe the time of putting society into crisis is has gone, and I think now working in education, um, to equip the young with means for being critical alone, sort of looking backwards, what's he done, what's she done, what are they, um, I think it's, that's, in a way that's absolutely essential, yeah. what I think the young need, um, you know, people in school, what they need for their lives is means for being productive, and for shaping the future in relation to their interests, um, and that's why I've used the notion of design. Design it says, I have interests, and um, I have interests which of course are socially shaped. I am a social person, I share a social history, I work in a social environment, I have to understand the social environment. I work always with um, social resources that the culture has made for me, resources which have been shaped over time by the culture of the society in which I am. So there's nothing about 
sort of a mere individualistic concern, think about my, but rather it is I am a in relation to a social environment, socially shaped resources with my own social history. And I think what our educator ought to be doing um, is to change the, the kind of perspective from looking backwards, um, or, or rather looking very much backwards, which is of course not the view of the competence, but the competent, in other words, let me perform convention. Um, well, it's not by, by, by uh, but um, the movement critic is looking back and saying, of course there are always limitations, and how can you be agent? How, how can you act in relation to your interests in the, in the society? Um, that's, um, that's broadly the point to, to change. But I think we'll read from all this, the kind of political project, but I think the way of um, implementing that political project has to be apt to the period in which we are. And I think that the period in which we are is one which expects us, um, expects of me, I think, working in education to provide the young with a vision and shaping, shaping the future um, in relation to their interests. Now, the only thing I want to say, I don't want to say any more about it, I've kind of um, at times attempt to talk about it, is of course you need it. Uh, because otherwise you'll have this, uh, in this situation which goes to naturalism. You know, uh, as far as I'm concerned, as long as I'm all right, all that, that's, no, not at all. An ability to see just in this environment where others have interests and they have to be um, attended to. So that's broadly, uh, and now I've spent a quarter of an hour maybe um, just uh, explaining it. Um, so the questions I suppose um, I would have is um, in education, what are the relevant questions now to be asked? Um, if I'm interested in representation and communication, what is the kind of theory that I need for the present? Um, if I'm interested in the political project, project that I should be engaged in, um, is it uh, just that of critique or is it something else? And if I remain seriously, whatever being an academic now might mean, and Ken and I had a little sort of nostalgic conversation about that uh, just before, before the lecture, but if I, as academics, are seriously interested in the truth, knowing that the truth is historically shaped, um, then what is the better truth? What can be the best? available and possible account. So those rough types of questions which aren't all that different to what um, the questions were that we had then, though of course differently expressed. We didn't put that to the, um, the relevant questions to ask around representation um, and communication. Of course, in the 1970s, when we were doing this kind of stuff, not for only really, at least, a challenge, it wasn't even a question of challenging, it, didn't, it hadn't appeared on the horizon that other things had um, nor had it appeared on our horizon, but it's uh, blatantly obvious that you cannot talk about language. Language is a theoretical fiction. You know, as far as I, I, I can do it and remind myself of it, um, I prefer to talk about speech. And I think writing is so different um, that the possibilities of representing with um, the material of sound, as against graphic material played on the, on the surface, are, are in, entirely different. I mean, as all, everybody knows, uh, um, you, know, you try and turn a transcript of a conversation into regard a, 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 a usual kind of written account and you see that everywhere, at every moment, we have real problems um, with the contextual time. Let me all uh, different notes, but that's what we were asking about. We said if we understood the language, if we understood how interviews operate and power and uh, all these tools. Cool. Um, and of course since then um, it's become too obvious um, for words so to say, well that alone won't give us an account of how meaning is made in our societies. And, and you know, from the banal to the not so banal, from the bus um, to uh, Liverpool Street um, uh, railway station, um, sort of seeing over there, on the, on the wall over there, um, a, a sign that um, Morrison's parking space, um, and it has a, a diagram underneath, you know, where it shows the kind of alley to this building. And I, I, I think to myself, how would you do that linguistically? Here are these people kind of driving along and you head aside to look at that. We begin to our own meanings that we wish to make, or that we even know they actually uh, possibly have a sort of like the like you present the engine in for it. In fact, they can't represent everything. Now, um, emerges, um, if there are um, possibilities for representation uh, of the position by writing, which is based on display, um, do they um, have the senses or are the affordances to be in the uh, personality uh, just writing or in speech? And I would say no. Uh, I think in the assumption um, in, in West for quite some hundred years that rationality um, is guaranteed by like, the last uh, maybe that it's guaranteed by written language. And I would say no, it explicit itself in especially when you work in education, 
And you see that uh, young people rip themselves in their knees in many different ways, most of which are disregarded um, as being kind of not even sort of visible or um, what you're pretending to. You, you realize that something has to change in our theories of representation and, and communication. So the notion of multimodality is an attempt to do that. Um, and multimodality is saying um, not so much that um, we have um, pretty you know, useful working accounts of a semiotic system, of two semiotic systems, speech and writing. Why might we therefore translate the descriptions and all the accounts that we have from there onto this mode here? Uh, well, I think that you cannot uh, translate the descriptions and the theories which are um, developed in relation to speech, um, which is translated, which um, is governed by the logic of time. Um, the sound of the materiality, which is sound, uh, with all its um, range of uh, you can't translate descriptions and theories um, which um, relate to speech, or maybe those sent to writing, um, to image, uh, the logic of which is space, and um, organization, um, speech and sequentiality, um, speech, um, temporality, sequentiality, space, um, with um, um, spatial display, spatial organization, and simultaneity. It's absolutely crucial that in speech one thing is said at a time, because what that means is you have to wait sort of certain amounts of time before you can actually make an assumption about what I've been saying. Um, you're sort of more in my hands than if an image uh, where you see this thing by yourself and you can make a decision um, as to how you want to um, see it. So um, another way of uh, sort of putting the question about uh, multimodality is to say, um, are there kinds of things, are there forms of representation um, which we ought to attend to, um, but which um, the theories we have to say, linguistic theory, um, doesn't really say anything about, and if that's the case, well then what are we going to do about it? Um, let me then give you uh, my first example of what I'll do. I'll try and um, work by sort of um, um, using examples both directly, sort of, um, uh, but also metaphorically. Uh, so see them both and um, what they are, but also largely metaphor. So um, here is uh, a written uh, uh, made by a three and a half year old. Um, some of you may have seen it, I've used it several times in, in things I've written. Um, now, um, if we take seriously that when a human makes a representation there is being made, that is, human work is meaningful, um, and human semiotic work, if, which this is, is always meaningful, the question is, um, what is uh, the meaning which is, which is um, an issue here? Um, and the other question, um, oh, thank you. Um, and the other question is, um, um, would a linguistic account have um, any means of dealing with it? I mean, um, could we describe the clauses, or the graphemes, or the sentences, or the... Uh, well, basically, a linguistic account has something to say about it. So, there's already a question about, about the discipline that we need in order to make sense of this. Always assuming that we want to say that when humans, whether they're three and a half years old, or 35 years old, or 65 years old, work, and do semiotic work, other work too. So, that, that would be our first question. Now, um, when I show you the other example I, I tend to use with it, um, you'll, you'll sort of see what I mean. I mean, um, and how we name this, of course, is really important. I mean, if we name it uh, Scribble, for instance, um, we've basically said, yeah, don't bother, it's not worth looking at. And if we say emergent writing, and we've said, what is it that's emerging and in what way? Um, so, but if you looked, uh, as I, I sort of uh, can, uh, uh, the accident of having somebody doing a PhD with me at the time, um, um, a woman from Taiwan, um, whose daughter Sarah, four years old, and was doing roughly the same as Emily was doing um, um, in London then. And suddenly you see that there is something different. Um, what seems maybe just scribble here, and what may be to the Taiwanese eye, might have also seen scribble there. When you see the difference, um, you, you see that um, the difference in the culturally um, salient world that these two young people have engaged with has led to different forms. It's not anarchic, it's not arbitrary. There is something that is discernibly uh, distinctive about it. And this is uh, clearly um, a character based on writing. And, and now I can say this is clearly, uh, by comparison with that, um, an alphabetically based system of writing. But linguistics wouldn't tell me about that. You need to shift away um, from linguistics. Um, and then you could sort of say, well, um, if it is meaningful, how can I get meaning from that? And uh, I suppose I've attempted to say some things about it. And the contrast makes it easier. So for instance, 
where Emily says the entities um, in this uh, representational system um, huh, we've lost the um, comparison here um, yeah. so, it's a good so it doesn't slip away um, where Emily seems to have said, I mean, she didn't say that, but I mean, seems to have kind of indicated here that she thinks the, the script system of her culture are relatively simple. Sarah seems to suggest that the script, the, the entities of the script system of her culture are complex. Yeah? So that um, where Emily seems to have suggested that the, script, uh, the entities of the script system of her culture are repeated, um, Sarah seems to suggest that in all cases, uh, the entities are different. Yeah, so on the one hand, simple, complex, repeated, uh, um, never repeated, always different. Um, where she has uh, shown that they are connected, Sarah has shown that they are not connected. Um, both have put them online, and we can kind of develop um, something that might represent the principles which emerge, the principles with which they, which they define their engagement with this framed bit of their cultural world. Um, and then I think we can sort of say, well, that gives us an insight into what meanings uh, they have made. That's what I mean here. But um, the question that I uh, had raised was, um, can um, a theory which attends to, say, the linguistic stuff alone, um, um, can that actually say something about that? And if it, if it can't, then either we've ruled out sways of stuff uh, from being considered as being significant, um, or else we need to change um, our theoretical approach. And I suppose what I've done over, over the years um, has moved from um, linguistic, linguistics to semiotics um, uh, because I think semiotics tends to sort of um, say something about uh, these things. And something else that, um, say, just to show you, um, Emily um, at that time had done, for instance, a drawing. These kinds of affinities are um, the representation of the, the written world here, but this is a uh, uh, the skeleton of a, a balsa wood um, dinosaur that happened to be standing on the, uh, the room. Um, in fact, it didn't look quite so neat as I've done it by tracing over the thing that she had done. Um, what she had done was something you can faintly see. Um, she had done that. I sort of saw it. I thought, oh, right. Um, um, traced over it, got my neat sort of uh, representation of it, and left it. Um, a week later, we had all the saw it. But it had something else which made me. It had this marking over it. And I thought, hey, what's, what's she done? And uh, I think what, she, what she's done um, is, well, I was um, I think she's sort of said there are kinds of regularities here. And there's sort of kinds of regularities. And she's had regularities um, that she's discerned um, in the structure of this skeleton by this overlay of, of pink lines. Um, and now you could begin to which um, um, I could have asked before, and I shall ask in a moment. Oh, interesting. Uh, uh, you can say, well, if they're interested in meaning, but meaning um, more than just um, meaning of the kind of set, but something which begins to nudge towards uh, symbology, like as, as knowledge or, or ideology, um, what I think this is saying is this is a move towards abstraction, isn't it? Um, um, which um, would it's um, represented down here a relatively realist fashion looks like this. The pink overlay um, is very general. It's abstracted. It's abstracted from the structure to something else. Um, and so you can see the notion of abstraction doesn't depend on the linguistic. Um, where we might say, well, you like abstraction from a whole clause or something like that, um, or other kinds of abstractions. But abstraction happens in all modes of representation that we have. And then the beginning of it. And then the traction of this like the ordinary process of discourse. Just go back to, um, to uh, these two examples and ask the question about um, discursive and seems quite logical. Something really interesting there. Um, um, but um, you know, why not? Um, if it's meaningful. Um, and I would say it habituates the person who is in the system, in this system, uh, towards linear strain, linear organization. Um, of course, here, organized from right to left, um, Emily was um, at that time writing left-handedly, um, uh, but it's linear. And linearity isn't a million miles from other kinds of things which become really important, like notions of um, um, how we think of time or how we represent time. If you think of timelines in the West, um, then linearity is an absolutely crucial uh, component of it. Um, or if you think of sort of development um, and, and linearity, you, know, you can see that um, even at this early point, um, the notion of um, 
there's fundamental things that uh, are uh, actually being said there. Now, I should have brought a different example, but um, some years ago, about three years ago, uh, a colleague of mine, Shami and Ken and I did a um, project on uh, how young um, Chinese and Arabic uh, children in, in London learn the script systems of their home letters while being in English uh, primary schools. And what we're discussing, and every, um, um, everyone here who has been taught um, uh, the character based script probably knows it, that young Chinese are first um, taught to um, construct characters, it's on a square piece of paper. And each square is basically the, um, the, um, the frame in which the character has to be placed. And the character has to be placed, um, as it were, perfectly balanced in the center of the square. Right? Yeah, so um, in this system here, what you have is um, a, a quite a complex thing because the, the, the character is placed um, is, um, is placed, is represented square, um, um, sort of, sorry, perfectly centered in a square. Um, of course, there's another kind of pedagogy that the, the character might do in strokes, and the children are taught that the strokes have to be um, performed in an absolutely fixed order, so kind of notions of ordering are uh, also in here and there. But something about this system here, which orients you towards an perception of the world in terms of things are placed in a square. Um, Whereas um, the Western, but also the, say for instance, the Arabic uh, versions of uh, the alphabetic scripts, um, where linearity is, um, is uh, dominant, um, have quite a different, uh, different um, effect. And um, now, this is important, I think it's crucially important, um, to learn that when you make this character, um, these two strokes in the character must be performed in exactly um, the right sequence, and the character must end up being perfectly balanced in the square, and that is this. That's pretty important. And so, um, normally you have a page which with the squares, the page is all squares, and of course the character when it's learned is kind of developed from the first stroke up here, second stroke, third stroke down here. But when the children make the first stroke, they already place it um, somewhere in the square so that when the other uh, 21 strokes have been added to it, the character is in the square. Um, um, five minutes. Um, sorry? Okay, um, well, I won't get anywhere near where I wanted to get, but um, it's sort of neither here nor there. So, um, I want you to say that um, these are the kinds of theory um, which wants to be um, apt to understanding the meaning and well, um, really needs to deal with them. Um, okay, um, and lastly, I'll just um, uh, leave this little bit and then maybe I'll have time for one more example. Um, Something else that um, maybe critical discourse analysis hasn't sort of dealt with all that much um, is the notion of affect. Um, um, so on the whole, um, and it's not, that's not true. I mean, for instance, even in the papers that um, I've heard today, people have talked about the interpersonal um, these terms, the interpersonal um, um, aspects of like how is power displayed um, in interviews or interactions uh, or whatever. But nobody's talked about African people. Again, we talk about the ideation or what is actually sort of being uh, represented. But here, when you look at um, Emily, um, about a year after the thing you saw, writing her name, um, you wonder why is she kind of um, investing so much effort um, in the league? There's a lot of kind of um, time goes in the league. So it's, um, this little phase there. Um, she had obviously uh, two kinds of things. Now, the E is really significant, uh, obviously, the letter of my name, but also the question about um, what the colleague of mine called numerosity, like just how many bars are there um, in an E. Um, so, but how do we factor that into um, a theory representation? And does affect appear after a while, or is affect always there? Um, and is affect even in, a, in the dry scientific report, but transformed and changed them? And, 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 and reposition. Um, and will linguistic theory actually give us um, an insight? I think. Um, and will a linguistic theory give us insight into the fact that um, the question of numerosity um, isn't just um, isn't just confined um, to, as it were, this the, the kind of writing system, um, but it's also sort of appears at, at that time everywhere. In other words, these are features which spread right across representation. So. Uh, when she represents, uh, as you can see here, a camel, um, it's just, uh, just how many, sorry, um, um, just how many humps um, are there on a, on a camel, or how many legs? Yeah, sort of um, a lot, I suppose. Um, um, okay. 
Um, so I think uh, I'm a theory which kind of can these things. Um, um, all the things which um, I think um, I need to understand in order to understand, get a sense of um, how I form myself um, as a subject, as a human subject, as a person in the culture or in the set of us um, in which I act. Um, and to reduce it to uh, the spoken and the written alone, um, I think that for me um, is far too, um, uh, too narrow. Now, um, I'll just sort of leave along the to and um, maybe come um, to a somewhat different point. Um, I mean, I've, I've written all these things um, somewhere. Um, and I want to come to this notion of um, um, the question of design. Um, and I want to do it um, in relation to um, how many more minutes? Um, Ten, ten minutes, thank you. Um, in, in relation to an example which comes from a research group which a colleague and I um, did in, in, uh, in science, in science classrooms. We had three research projects in, uh, in science classrooms. The last of them was called um, the rhetoric of the science classroom. And rhetoric, uh, I want to come back to as an important um, question for me. Um, rhetoric is the politics of communication, um, and, and, and therefore, um, the moment you invoke the notion of rhetoric, you are in the social and uh, political domain. Um, but the example is uh, one where, after four months, um, a group of 13-year-olds um, in a school classroom, um, all young women, are being asked, um, um, well, they've been talking um, in this classroom about what cells are like, plant cells. Um, and uh, the usual experiment which is conducted is that you get an onion, um, you kind of pull out the thin epidermis between the fleshy layers of the onion, you put it on a slide, is it on there? Um, yeah? You place it on a slide, you stain it with iodine so it's brown rather than transparent, you put a cover slip on it, um, and that's uh, how you create a slide. <coughs> the slide is uh, placed under a microscope, um, and then the teacher says, um, I'd like you to um, yeah, do the slide, place it under the microscope, look through it, and then I want you to um, draw what you see, saw, and write what you did. So two, two instructions, um, draw what you saw and write what you did. Um, two further instructions, um, uh, put, put your text, um, the written text at the top of the page and the, the picture at the bottom, um, and don't use color pencil. Yeah? Um, um, put the writing at the top because otherwise you'll make a big image and don't do any writing. Um, color pencil because, don't use color pencil because color pencil obviously isn't scientific. Science is black and white. So this is the instruction. But I just draw you to um, a sentence here. Um, uh, um, look at the slide um, uh, here. It should look each with the cell. Okay. So four young women prepared um, the slide, um, talking to each other constantly, and then they um, put it under the, the uh, microscope. Um, and I'll show you just two of the things that they did. Um, one looked like this, um, and against the teacher's instructions, um, she had put the drawing at the top, um, um, and then she had um, what they did. Uh, what first the a man peeled the skin off uh, the onion while I got the microscope. The man put the onion the skin on the slide, then I put a drop of iodine on the, the onion, then we put a bar. Uh, so sort of recount of what happened. Yeah? The genre would be recount. Um, and, um, and looked at the same slide through the same microscope and saw this. Um, yeah, this is what she saw. So she put um, the drawing at the bottom, as she had been asked to do. Um, she um, put the writing at the top, as she was asked to do, to use colored pencil, as she was instructed not to do. <laughs> um, and of course, in each case, you would ask, um, why? Um, I think she used, um, in fact, she, uh, um, she's not the worst offender. <laughs> others, um, the two others that used color pencil. Um, to represent this. Um, in other words, their notion of realism um, seemed to demand why, in other words. Okay, but what she written, remember the teacher had said, write what you did. Um, so she says, step one, peel off a bit of onion skin. Uh, step two, you can onto a microscope slide and put a cover slip on top. So it's sort of like a honey cream. Um, now, is this a, an account of what they did? Well, it's not, is it? It's, um, um, it's a procedure. I mean, it's the, it's the first is a recount of what we did. This is a procedure. Um, but now look at this thing. In terms of drawing what you saw, this seems to be a misrepresentation of what she might have seen 
and looking through the, the microscope. Yeah? The, the eyepiece of the microscope is here, and what is kind of in there is kind of represented. Whereas um, in this one here, um, something really strange because her friend had seen something like this, this thing here, which is quite unlike um, what the other one saw. <laughs> but remember the instruction um, at, the, at the bottom of the, um, the handout. Uh, it says, <laughs> Um, look at the slide, it should look like a brick wall, each brick is a cell. Yeah. What I'm thinking is that um, she had said, well, I'm, I'm being given a little bit of theory. Um, it's a kind of a messy case, but theory kind of orders it. And I've been told how to make order of it, so I'll see. A brick. Um, and she's represented what theory has told her to see. Um, except for these air bubbles. And here, she follows, um, it's true, so the account follows the line of the empirical reading. The recount is that. Yeah? So if you think in a science classroom, what is an issue, of course, is how to, to learn about plant cells, but what is really an issue is what is being scientific about? Then that is um, accountability in terms of theory, but also you know, this is practically um, accurately. Um, and if you this young person here, she says scientific, being scientific um, is um, setting down the goal of the same practices as well. Otherwise, uh, we would have anarchy. And to be empirical, you really have to be precise. So both have an addition, um, the empirical definition to a kind of regularity. Um, and to display. Um, try to fully display. Now, um, I'll, I'll finish here with. A... Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm working in education. The theory of, of learning says, um, what does the theory of learning say? The theory of learning might say, I have the authority, I convey to you uh, what it is that um, you ought to find or act to. And success um, in terms of assessment is um, a measure of the ability to adapt yourself or re represent that which I've given to you. That's a kind of a, a measure of, um, that you might apply in assessment. Um, a different measure of um, which I'm suggesting is you might say, Cecily and Sarah, what principles did you um, employ? Which principles did you bring to your engagement with the world? And, and therefore, what principles should I, uh, what should I understand of the principles which you've brought to the engagement of your world? Um, so that I might understand who you are, what you see as salient, um, and what you're making of the world. Not in order to kind of um, say um, that which science has discovered and labored over hundreds of years um, as, as knowledge is insignificant, but rather as a means of saying, okay, understand the principles which you bring, and it is essential for me to understand that, um, and your reasonable account of um, the world um, on this occasion, reasonable both um, in, uh, represented in the visual mode and reasonable represented um, in the verbal mode um, in order for me then to take the next step to bring you uh, closer to my account. So it's not about relativism and anything goes, but rather it's to say the action of the individual um, is significant. And in terms of rhetoric, it's a kind of a turning around from a guy which I think said um, what is significant is the action of the rhetor in relation to me in relation to the, whom the ritual wanted to convince or to, uh, to dominate or to oppress or something, let me look at what the ritual did in relation to me. This here is saying, and I design, the, <coughs> sorry, I design uh, my representation in relation to my interests and I put that representation into the world um, as my account of what the world is like. It's still a rhetorical account, but uh, instead of ritual, um, committed to me, which um, I then have to attempt to understand, I say, I am now the ritual. I'm the person who's agent uh, in relation to the representations which I make, and I make them for others um, in the world. Now, in terms of the effects um, um, of education on, on learning theory um, and on, um, on assessment, I think um, uh, the effects um, would be truly um, a revolution. I put the agency of children as learners in the center, and it would demand that those who teach um, um, or are uh, charged with um, enabling the, um, I don't know, the um, understanding of these young people, it would make their uh, task uh, an entirely different. Power would be relocated, um, and power would be relocated. Power, of course, I think is the sub point of the, um, um, the paradigm which is called um, uh, critical discourse analysis. So in a sense, for me, there's an entire continuity between what I think I'm doing at the moment and uh, in the way that I'm doing it, multimodally now, in terms of ethics, um, and the starting point, um, some 30 years ago um, in this room in which we are now. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. We have about 10 minutes for questions.
the art of frames are also kind of firm and or, or, or disintegrate. That, that's really funny.
or yes. even music yes. a symphony yes. of a play. Yeah. True enough, the diplomatic the convention is accepted. Yes. 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 Um, absolutely, um, predictably, um, the song which is made in the book is a song which can never be. Um, yeah.